Hi, I'm your host, Didi Chang. Audio Builders TV presents Broadcast Audio with Rick Smith. Rick sat down with me to explain broadcast audio. He is an A1 who has worked at major sporting events for over 30 years. You have heard his work at the 2014 Sochi Olympics, the Major League Baseball, HBO Boxing, and the WWE. Audio Builders TV is produced by the students of Concord Carlisle High School with help from Colonial Sound and CCTV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and subscribe to our mailing list at audiobuildersworkshop.com. <laughs> Audio Builders. Audio Builders Workshop is a work group for the Boston chapter of the Audio Engineering Society. I hear you work as an A1. Do you mind telling us the difference, or elaborating on the difference between working as an A1 in a broadcast truck versus working as an A1 in a television studio? I think the, uh, I think the major difference is uh, the setup. Uh, television studio is already preset for uh, an engineer who comes in to mix in it. In a broadcast truck, you're basically uh, walking into an unbuilt uh, television setup, an unbuilt audio uh, setup. So uh, there, there's traditionally a patch field, a console, communication system that all has to be designed quickly for the event and built by the A1 on set. So uh, typically you'll, on uh, Depending on the show, you'll have days to set up, sometimes just hours to set up. And so one of the biggest challenges is uh, that the trucks are not all identical. So if you haven't seen the truck before, you, you will at least be learning a new patch field and a new way that they've integrated their communication system into the truck's infrastructure, and perhaps even a new console. If you're lucky, They'll at least be using one of the standard consoles, and it's a console you'll know ahead of time. You'll know the communication system ahead of time. So you just need to learn the new patch field, and then you'll need to figure out how they've integrated the communication system and the audio system into their, into their truck, and then build the show around that. So uh, that's probably the major difference between uh, broadcast and studio. So there's only, only, did you say only one A1 on? Typically, uh, there's only one. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, on some bigger shows, that job can sometimes get split into some, some more roles. Uh, for instance, uh, I've been doing a lot of work for the WWE, and they have an entire truck dedicated to the audio portion of the broadcast. Most trucks, it's an integrated uh, video production video replay, graphics, and audio are all in one, one truck. Uh, in the WWE, video replay, graphics, tape, or tape, graphics, video productions in one truck, and then audio has its own dedicated truck. The audio is also separated then into a few different roles. And uh, there's actually an A1 who's responsible for patching and troubleshooting, another A1 responsible for the show, and then another A1 responsible for mixing portion of the show. And it's uh, the portion of the show that is sometimes called effect sound and sometimes called nat sound. And that's in a sporting context, that's the sounds uh, from the game that's going on or fr and from the crowd in the arena. And then the main A1 on that show is dealing with the, the sounds from the announcers, the music taking the elements from that other mix and, and putting them together to, to form the show. Okay, so do you mind telling me about, um, or giving an overview of signal flow in a bro uh, sports broadcast? I will try, I will try. Uh, sports has uh, unique signal flow challenges. Uh, and one of the best examples that I can give you is, uh, in, in, a lot of us watch the Red Sox. A lot of us love watching the Red Sox when they hit a home run. Well, when the announcers uh, broad, uh, talk about that home run in real time. Uh, that all gets recorded together. But when, if we play back that home run in real time for a replay, and we want to play it back with sound, we don't want the announcers at the same time, because they're going to talk now about the replay. They, they don't want to be competing with what they said before. So somewhere we had to record just the sounds of the bat crack mics and the crowd 
minus the announcers, and we call that a mix minus in, in, the, in the field. And so that's one example of one of the mixes that's beyond our full program mix. Obviously, we're mixing. We take elements from the announcers. We take elements from the crowd. We take elements from the game. We take elements of music, replay. We mix those all together. We broadcast those for transmission. We also record those internally in the truck to archive them and maybe to play back segments with everything. But then we also have to record mix minuses for events like this. Another uh, example of a mix minus that has to get built, uh, often a broadcaster will sell the rights of their broadcast to other countries where they're going to put other languages on top of the broadcast. Well, in that case, you need to build a mix minus that contains all of the elements of the mix except the announcers, not just the crowd, not just the bat crack mics, but all of the elements of the mix so that that can be sold as a package to a foreign language. So, and that, that's more common than you'd think. Uh, and then there's other elements within the, with internally that also get, get uh, put together that are, uh, again, other routing challenges for the A1. Uh, the announcers are often stripped from the mix. So for those in the know, pre-fade aux bus, pre-fade uh, multi-track bus, or even a direct output for an individual announcer or maybe a group of announcers. So they could be built as listen-onlys for directors, producers, so that they, have, uh, they can focus in on what the announcers are saying pre-fade without having all that other baloney from the mix getting in the way, so it's easier for them to do their job. Another circuit that they listen to that you might not know about back home is called, we call the talkback circuit, and which I find, the thing I find great, at, I've done some work in England, they call it the lazy in England for some reason. They also call a router a router, but that's another story. But the lazy, or the talkback, uh, uh, an announcer has a button in front of them that redirects their microphone signal to an alternate bus and that shows up as a listen speaker inside the production room so that now the announcer can say something like, uh, one of the announcers can say on the talkback circuit, hey, that was good, I really want to see a replay of that. And it won't, we won't hear that on air, but they'll be able to have the communication with the director. Now, of course, the announcers are also listening to headsets, so another mix you have to generate. So you have to mix, make, it, make a, a mix to generate for them to listen to, and that includes what's called an interrupt from that comm system we talked about in the last segment. And now the director, producer, anyone on the truck can interrupt that program and talk directly to an announcer. Hey, Jim, we have a break in five minutes or five seconds or whatever it is. And that, that, that circuit allows them to, uh, to talk to the announcer. And then with that, in the combination of a talkback, while we're on air with another announcer or as the, as the, the, the show's going on, uh, a producer and an and a announcer can have a two-way conversation that doesn't end up on the air. Have you ever encountered any unique challenges or unique to the specific event that you were broadcasting? in terms of signal flow or just creating the mixes? I'll give you one, one example uh, which a, a, an audio person might appreciate, and that's uh, I talked about building a mix minus for an international broadcaster that stripped away announcer microphones but included every other element. Well, one of the unique challenges is in some of these events, an announcer will go on, into the ring into a boxing ring, for instance, after the fight and try to inter and interview one of the boxers. Well, now, most of the packages that are sold for boxing on this international broadcast, they want that element to also go to the international broadcasters. Mm -hmm. But now, at other times, that mic has to not and only go to the uh, American broadcast. So depending on the place, depending on the use of that mic, depends on whether it's going to the international or not going to the international. And this, this international broadcasts end up having the ones, the, being, the, uh, being the broadcaster, the most challenges that way. So can you tell me a little bit more about miking for uh, sports events or sports in general? 
Uh, I'll stay away from how we mic announcers because that's pretty obvious. We generally we mm -hmm. put a headset on them that has a microphone attached to it. Uh, so uh, I think the biggest challenge for an audio engineer with micing uh, a particular sport or an event is the fact that we don't use many direct mics. In fact, it's almost all distance micing. And we're taught when we're learning about miking techniques, when we're taught in the studio, uh, the, the furthest we might place a mic away from somebody is, is 10 feet away, for instance. We might mic an entire choir, and we might put some room mics in, or we might mic a drum set, we might mic a room. Uh, that would be the only indirect miking we use. So we're not used to trying to get our primary sounds from a faraway microphone. So in sports, we have a couple of different microphone styles to deal with this, uh, including parabolic microphones, which are those dishes you see the guys holding at the side of a football game, uh, and shotgun microphones, which are uh, you know, super, super cardioid. They're called shotguns because they're, they're long, long cylindrical uh, microphones. And they're very, very directional. And so I think the challenge first is learning how to listen to one of these microphones, to learning how to listen to something that's being picked up from far away. It's, it's a very different. Uh, the EQ strategies are different. Uh, let me get into some specifics. Uh, baseball uh, is a sport where we tend to mic uh, the bat crack area, the home plate area. We mic that with either shotgun microphones or position parabolic mics pointed at the home plate area so that we can get the sound of the ball hitting the catcher's mitt, the ball getting smacked by the bat, uh, or sometimes if we're very lucky, the sound of a player yelling or something like that. Hopefully not because he got the ball beamed off his helmet or whatnot. Some guys go far, uh, far enough to actually position a parabolic mic to pick up the sound of the ball being tossed back to the pitcher. So when the pitcher gets the ball back from the catcher, we actually hear that hitting his mitt. A well-aimed parabolic mic can actually pick that up from behind home plate. We also mic uh, first base and third base, typically, with shotgun mics, uh, or again, parabolic mics. And then on the major broadcasts, uh, sometimes they'll use microphones positioned out in the outfield as well. Uh, I know uh, at Fenway Park, we use a uh, a microphone behind the green monster, so that if the ball hits the wall, we actually hear that. If you listen to a Red Sox broadcast from 20 years ago, you would not hear that. If you listen to one from the last 10 years, the last 15 years probably, the ball's hit off the monster, we hear it. It sounds like a ball hitting the side of a metal barn door. It's great. Bam! Uh, one of the other things done in baseball occasionally is uh, Wireless lavalier mics will be hidden in the bases. And this is, this is uh, again, I think the last 10, 15 years, Fox has been a major developer in this. And they actually hide a little lavalier mic inside the base. And so sometimes you'll hear a runner's feet as the footballs as they round second base, for instance, or a, a pickoff play at second. Those were places that we never heard before. Uh, so uh, television mixers uh, tend to television sports mixers tend to get kind of creative to try to get us to hear elements of the game that we wouldn't have heard before. And are the microphones themselves, is there, are there people actively looking for ways to um, improve the sound quality or pick up smaller sounds? Is that something that's, I guess, being actively pursued right now? Yeah, it's all, always, and it's because we're all not so for trying to get the, to give the fan the coolest experience they can with mm -hmm. the game. And, and some of them you buy and some of them you don't buy. And I'm not going to tell you which ones I don't buy, but the one, a couple of the ones that I do buy, is, uh, and this has been going on for a long time, is we mic the net in a basketball game. We mic the hoop. And it's, you might not, as a casual fan, you might not notice this, but if you're a fan in the, at, the, at the arena, you don't hear the, the, the ball on a switch, mm -hmm. right? But at home, you hear it on TV. You don't think about it, but the reason you do is because there's a mic right under there. So some of it is, is done, and I, I always enjoy these ways. I enjoy it when it's done in a way that's very subtle but also enhances our, our enjoyment of, of the sport. I, I like that microphone because it also 
when a guy goes up for a slam dunk, and sometimes they make a lot of noise when they're doing it, they can, ah! You hear that too, because the mic's right up there near, near, their, near their voice. So what's the craziest thing you've ever mic'd? I think the most insane thing I've ever mic'd and that I asked an A2 to do for me was uh, at WrestleMania. And uh, I, I'm, I was submixing WrestleMania, which means uh, I'm handling the portions of the mix that aren't announcers and music. So I'm handling the Nat sounds. And at WrestleMania, this means there's lots of, besides the sounds that go on in the ring that we have to hear, there's also lots of pyro that we want to hear, lots of explosions, fireworks, and whatnot. Well, at WrestleMania, they shoot fireworks off the roofs of the, of the stadiums. And we were at the Dallas Stadium where the Dallas Cowboys play. This is in 2016, WrestleMania. And there's, the, the roof is closed. It's a dome. But we're still going to have an outside shot of the stadium with fireworks going off. So I had to ask an A2 to run microphones on top of the roof. And so if you can imagine this, I had, I had a, a, sh a, a stereo pair on each side of the roof pointed straight up in the air. Uh, to get this, and it took, if I remember right, it was about a 3,000 foot fiber run to the fiber box, and then another 2,000 feet of XLR audio pair up on the roof to get these, these things. Mike, and it took uh, two, two guys, an A2 and an assistant, a 10 hour day just to make this happen, but it had to happen because it's WrestleMania. So what if, some, if something does go wrong while you're in your broadcast truck? It depends on what goes wrong. Right. <laughs> um, obviously, the A1 is not working alone in any, in any time on a broadcast uh, truck. Uh, working with at least one A2 and perhaps several in the case of the WWE or a, a bigger event, Boston Marathon, uh, you might be working with a small team of A2s. And so they'll be working to do troubleshooting for you out in the field, set up and troubleshooting out in the field. And then you might have to communicate with them. A really strong A2 team will make it so that you do very minimal communicating with them. Uh, they'll be solving the problems for you as they arrive, if they're outside the truck. Now, there's obviously some things that can happen internally that become your problem, a console problem, a communication system problem, uh, routing between a video replay and the console. And then you have to work that out, hopefully, before air. Mm -hmm. And the real, the real challenge is, is those problems come up when you're trying to mix a show at the same time. Do you have maybe extra equipment with you, or how do you, how do you usually deal with that? I'll give you two good examples of redundancy. Uh, and uh, the first uh, was at Sochi in, uh, at the Olympic Games in 2014. And we had uh, three weeks to set up. I, I showed up three weeks before the show started. We had three weeks to set up. And in general, we, we had the studio up and ready, two studios, actually. I, I set up two, uh, the A studio and the B studio. We had those ready to roll in about a week. And then the next two weeks, we spent going over redundancy plans. And redundancy plans are if piece of gear a fails, what is the plan B, and then maybe what is the plan C? So for instance, we had, uh, I forget if it was eight wireless lavalier mics in the studio. It was Bob Costas' studio, and he, he was going to have up to eight guests. Well, we had eight ready to go, but then we had eight more as a redundancy. So the immediate backup for every microphone was another wireless lavalier microphone. And then after that, say the whole wireless system fails, well, the next backup to that was wired stick mics that could easily be pulled up onto the set with NBC mic flags on them. So that, that's step one of redundancy. Step two is now, now having uh, multiple paths into the console. But again, you back up one microphone with another microphone, so that, that backs that up. Uh, now, you, now you have the, the signal leaving the, leaving the console uh, goes to a transmission path. Well, that gets duplicated, so it goes to two transmission paths. So if one transmission path fails, the other one uh, come, uh, is, is easily brought online. Uh, tape sources, replay sources, uh, were brought directly into the console, but also into the console through a router. 
in fact, through multiple routers. So if one, if the main source, direct source fails, you could go to a router. If the router fails, you could go to a secondary router. So we had every signal coming into the console now, as you can, you know, can imagine, as best we could, was redundant. Then, as I said, we had built a second transmission path. Well, now what happens if the entire console fails? We actually had an entire secondary console built in each studio where we duplicated all the, all the input signals. So all the input signals, maybe not all the redundant input signals, but all of the primary input signals came into this redundant console. And that console fed the transmission paths, both the main and backup transmission paths, through a switch. And if you threw the switch, it took the main console offline and put the redundant console online. You follow me on that? On both paths. So that was backed up that way. So that kind of redundant thinking then, you carry, in, you carry this into every show, maybe not to that detail. And uh, the second example I'll give you is uh, uh, the WWE, uh, which I've been working with a lot lately. Uh, on our pay-per-views, we provide uh, coverage to eight non-English speaking languages. So we build we build, we have announcers on site that are speaking eight different languages besides English. And now, as we talked, discussed earlier, we take the mix minus from the main console, bring this into a secondary console, and now this gets mixed as eight separate transmission paths for these eight different languages. Long story short, the, we're using a Digico S10 as our mixing desk for these international languages. Its input and output is on, on just two MADI cards. And so now the MADI cards inter interface with the CalREC, and they also interface with the router. And we had, uh, in our original setup, we were using some from one, one of the MADI cards and some from one of the other MADI cards until we had a failure. And the failure we had wasn't actually in the SD10's MADI card, but it was in uh, one of the MADI cards feeding the router. And it was a scramble to get everybody back on the air. So we lost 10 minutes of air time. Now, this is expensive. Remember that the, the network is selling this coverage to these other languages. So losing 10 minutes of air time is a disaster. So we had to, we, I was part, I worked with a truck engineer and we reorganized the inputs and outputs so that now the two MADI cards in the SD10 are completely identical. So if we have a failure, and so now if we have a failure inside or outside the console on an interface with the truck router, we can just switch to the other, the other router. So say, the MADI to MADI card in the router on router card one fails, fails at the router. Well, now the router can just switch and take MADI card two instead mm -hmm. on another MADI interface with the truck router. You following me? Yes. It's okay if you're not. But mm -hmm. uh, so now that's completely interchangeable with a with a flick of a switch. And the other thing we managed to do was we brought in all of our inputs now on both MADI cards, and. Uh, MADI card 1 populates all of the main inputs on all the SD10 channels. MADI card 2 populates all of the alternate inputs on the SD10. And then another engineer who I work with, who's a really smart guy on the SD10, set it up so that on one button push, we can go from MADI card 1 to MADI card 2 on the inputs. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of redundancy and immediacy in redundancy that's really important in live, in live coverage no matter what the event. Uh, and if you, if you do a little research, it goes, it goes beyond that. It goes, it's, it goes down to details like uh, uh, UPS power supplies on, on uh, any piece of equipment in the, in, the, in the building that is critical. So that if we're doing an interview on this fiber, this audio analog to fiber box, and the power goes down at that rack, well, the power doesn't really go down because it's backed up with the UPS. Mm -hmm. The WWE is so nutso for it that we actually have the entire truck backed up on a UPS system, which is awesome. It's like a 400 amp UPS backup, mm -hmm. three-phase UPS backup. So anyway, that's redundancy.
uh, that 10 minute um, of 10 minutes of no coverage is that the only time in your sort of career that you've ever experienced disaster to oh, an extent? Oh no, or? that was just another example. Oh, so there are other well, times. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites uh, was years ago. I was doing the, just a Nesson hockey game at Providence College, and it was so cold out, and, it, and we had the truck uh, powered on a generator because we didn't want to rely on the house power because it had been traditionally unreliable at this arena at Providence College. So we had it on a generator, but it got so cold that the diesel gelled and the generator froze up right before we hit air. So it was, it was almost this ridiculous. Okay, ready for air in 10, 9, 8, and we were, all, and, and then so it took them 20 minutes or whatever to, uh. to get now hooked up to house power because the generator was not dead. Audio Builders TV would like to recognize the Concord Education Fund for their generous support in the development of curricula, programs, and initiatives for students and teachers. One of the main differences uh, between broadcast audio and audio anywhere else in the world is that the, in the broadcast world, the audio people are responsible for communications with everyone on the broadcast. Uh, and that, that has history in it, and that goes back to the 1950s even, when audio engineers were more interested in that than anybody else on the truck or anybody else on a crew, so they got involved in it. And it's come to the point now where the uh, communication systems are extremely elaborate, and it becomes one of the most challenging aspects of the job, is to set up the communication system, particularly in a short time frame. If your setup is just hours long, to be efficient enough to get it set up in time is, can, can really hinders your ability to actually set up a decent audio mix mm -hmm. as well. Uh, on bigger productions, there's actually people dedicated. There's a, there's, a, there's a job out there for a young person who just wants to be an expert at communication systems and television broadcast. There, there's literally people hired just to do communication systems to take that job away from the A1. On most, and, uh, and on this I include some very higher level jobs, uh, the communication is integrated into the A1's position job and the A2's are there to help set that up. And the, today's communication systems are really based around an RTS system uh, which is called uh, uh, the ATOM system. This RTS is uh, made. Now there's another Another rival group called Riedel, which is used more often in Europe, but if you're an American uh, engineer, you want to learn this Atom system. And there's a lot of tools online to learn the Atom system uh, that RTS provides. Uh, but essentially, you have point-to-point -point communications with every member of the broadcast team. So videotape people, video people, graphics people, directors, producers, switchers, audio engineers, truck engineers. Point to point capability, meaning I could talk to any one of these people and have a private conversation. And then there's also what's called party line communications. And in the party line communications, there's a group of people designated to one channel and they communicate. And typically, then outside the truck, you'll have groups that are party line dedicated communications. And then you have stage managers on one group statisticians on another group, A2s on another group, perhaps you'll have spotters on another group. So, and typically you could have up to 12 external party line communications, plus internally as many as you wanted to build. Uh, so uh, that is one of the more challenging aspects of the broadcast engineer's job that you won't find in anywhere else in audio. Are there any latency issues that you have to deal with? Oh yeah, there are. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about my most recent example first. Uh, I recently uh, finished uh, one of my projects this past month was uh, the International for the Boston Marathon. And at the Boston Marathon finish line, at the fi uh, we, uh, one of our responsibilities was to send one of our talent, one of our reporters, to the finish line and uh, have an interview with the, uh, the person who just finished the race. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this, was, this goes for all the races. They have, they have a bunch of categories and blah, 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 blah. But anyway, we sent an RF camera down 
uh, to, the, to there. But now we've tried using an RF microphone. The problem with the RF microphone is every other news station, radio station, brings an RF microphone. So we get clobbered with interference at the finish line. So we've, we've stuck to using a, a, uh, a wired microphone. Now the wired microphone signal gets back to the console in real time. Obviously, you understand that because of the transfer into digital at the digital console, there's a slight amount of latency there. But it's nothing compared to the latency of the video signal. So the video signal, and this happens quite a bit now, particularly with the RF signal. The RF signal is encoded at the camera uh, and then decoded again where the audio is uh, uh, decoded again back at the RF uh, central. Then it goes into the, uh, the, the television truck. It goes through a frame sync, which delays the signal even more. So now if we put our talent on the air to ask the questions, the uh, audio would be ahead of the video. So we have to slow that down. So there's, that's one place where we have to time align uh, the audio signal to the video signal. And for the audio engineers out there, I, if my memory serves correct, it was about 190 milliseconds, which I, I forget how many frames that is, but it's a ridiculous amount of time in audio time. 190 milliseconds is almost a quarter of a second of delay that we had to add to time up the lips with the uh, camera. Now the other example I'm going to give is uh, another trend that I've seen lately is uh, shooting your on camera, on your, your on headset announcers with like a GoPro camera. And again, the GoPro camera isn't one of our modern pro cameras and it has to go through a frame sync back at the video. Now, please don't ask me what a frame sync is, but uh, for all I gather with it is that the video signal also has to get into lockstep, time, timing lockstep with the other video signals on the truck and a frame sync makes that happen. Okay, so it takes whatever video, the video signal coming into it and locks it up with the, the other signals in the truck so that it can be switched without any errors. Uh, but anyway, there's another case now where if they put those talent on camera with one of our regular cameras, we can have no delay in it. And if we, but if we put it on line with the GoPro camera, now we have to add delay. And I, I guess the part of this that I, that I keep forgetting to mention is our announcers are listening to themselves. Obviously, we can't throw 190 millisecond delay back into their headsets for them to listen to. So we actually have to set up their mix now to, going at the same time. So the same time we're opening up the fader with the delay on it, we have to also set up another fader using a VCA to open up the fader of their mic in real time not to go to air, but just to go to their headset. And I, I want to go further, because uh, the, the really, really cool thing that, that's happening now with the Atom system is when it originally came out, it had, you had analog cards in this Atom system, so you could have analog communication, analog in, analog out, then AES in, AES out. Now there's also MADI cards and Dante cards in the Atom system, so now you're seeing the atom is as a frame of communication, but also being in to, to able to integrate communication, analog, AES, MADI sources, and Dante sources. So it's a much more flexible platform. All right. Thank you so much. We'll Thank check you. in with you next time. All right. <laughs>